Tastemakers was funded in part by... What does a craftsperson look like? Is it this? Or this? Or is it this? Is it possible a craftsperson might also look like this? Edward Jones salutes the makers who share their expertise and take pride in their craft. And by Fleischmann's Yeast. And A.B. Murray. away in a tiny greenhouse on the North Fork of Long Island, Taylor and Kate Knapp are hand raising tens of thousands of snails in the country's first USDA certified snail farm. Today on Tastemakers, we're heading east to meet two of the country's few snail farmers. I'm Kat Neville and I've been telling the story of local food for about 20 years. In that time, I've seen the American food movement explode in tiny towns and big cities from coast to coast. In Tastemakers, I explore the maker movement and take you along for the journey to meet the makers who define the flavor of American cuisine. People have been eating land snails for about 30,000 years, but the majority of what we eat here in America comes out of a can from a foreign country. That's starting to change as heliculture, also known as snail farming, is picking up traction. And so we're going to meet up today with the folks from Peconic Escargot here on Long Island. I grew up in Indiana, and the food bug kind of came about, I think, through my grandfather, who was a big connoisseur of oysters and, you know, foie gras and, and all of these kind of strange uh, ingredients. And I would go out and I would forage with him in the woods of Indiana. We'd pick mushrooms and, and pawpaws and whatever else was out there and available. And so he was kind of the, the, the foodie of the family. And it kind of inspired me to get started in that too. So uh, I gave it a try in high school through a vocational program and decided I wanted to kind of pursue it further. So I've been cooking uh, professionally for about 12 years, kind of all over the country, a lot on the East Coast and a little bit in Europe. In 2010, I made my way out to Long Island and didn't really know about the scene out here and the fact that we could go from a beach to a vineyard to foraging in the woods all within a very small radius. Just kind of fell in love with it. Out here on Long Island, I was the chef at a restaurant called First and South in Greenport and I took a really kind of targeted local approach with the menu as is quite popular these days. But I also wanted to have some surprises on there. So I thought it would be fun to put some snails on the menu to do an escargot dish. And I looked and I tried to find some fresh locally raised snails and we couldn't find them anywhere. And we looked, you know, kind of all over the East Coast and figured there might be someone doing it and there was nothing. So then we kind of ultimately came to the conclusion that there was no one raising these snails um, at all, uh, not for fresh consumption. I couldn't even bring them in fresh from another country. The only way you could get uh, escargot in the U.S. was to get them from a can or frozen, kind of pre-prepared. A chef friend of mine, but he's a really knowledgeable guy, I had texted him and I said, do you know of anyone raising snails in the U.S.? And he jokingly replied, uh, no, you should start a farm. You should raise them yourself. And I like totally blew it off. That's, you know, that's ridiculous. But it was a long winter on the North Fork and it gets a little slow out here because it's very seasonal. And so the gears started turning and uh, I molded over and decided, well, why not? Let's, let's look into this and see, maybe there's something here. And so a lot of research and work and, you know, a couple months later, it kind of settled on the idea that we were going to give it a shot and see what would come of it.
We haven't done any official polls, but I think 99% of Americans that eat escargot probably don't realize that they're coming out of a can from another country, even. So to be able to say this is a fresh product that came from the United States and was raised here, that's kind of eye-opening for them. It's a completely different product from the canned stuff. As with most canned products, there's a lot of sodium in there, and it's been cooked for a long time. So it's kind of just tastes like a, any sort of piece of meaty bit. You know, that's, that's really it. But the fresh snails have a texture to them. They pop, they're kind of juicy. And they have a sort of very earthy, herbaceous flavor, especially the way that we're raising them. We're trying to mimic their diet as close as possible what they would be eating in the wild. A lot of that is wild greens, so we'll forage greens from all over Long Island, and the snails like it. They eat a lot of dirt because they need the calcium for their shells. And then we're finishing them on spent grain from some of the local breweries. And that does a couple different things. It moves any you know, impurities out of their system so that you're not eating it. And then it kind of lends a nice, nutty, uh, toasty note to the final product, which is cool. There's kind of a terroir about it all. The snails are eating greens from Long Island. They're raised on Long Island. It couldn't get any more like fresh and domestic than that. Small food producers need a commercial kitchen in order to bring their products to market. So places like Stony Brook Business Incubator step in and they offer these entrepreneurs not only kitchens, but also the support they need to succeed. Stony Brook University has an incubation program and the purpose of it is to support fledgling companies that are in the early stages of growth and need support from infrastructure to business guidance. The particular incubator we're in today, the Calverton Incubator, has a commercial food kitchen for food product companies. There is a desire for local food, for natural products, for organic products, for fresh products, not just produce. And that has shifted this market interest to smaller companies, because that's where innovation tends to come from from the small companies that disrupt the status quo. And we're trying to create an infrastructure to support those companies and increase the rate of innovation in the food industry. When I first learned about Peconic Escargot and what they were bringing to the market, I was stunned to find out that they were the only producer in the United States that could deliver fresh escargot to restaurants and food companies. I had no idea that there was that limitation, that any escargot I had eaten to date came out of a can. And I think that's quite a novel value and creates a very nice opportunity for them in the market. Stony Brook University Incubator at Calverton is where we process all of our snails. And it's really provided us the opportunity to put together a professional sanitary product very easily and cost effectively. I'm standing here with Taylor and Kate while they're processing their snails. They're sorting out which ones have very firm shells and which are brittle. And they're actually going to go through 7,000 snails today. They'll be here for many hours. And so some chefs want just the body and some chefs want the snail in the shell. Is that why you're separating these out? Yeah, exactly. So there's an old school technique of maybe braising the snail in the shell. They're great that way, but they do involve a little labor for the customer because you have to pick them out. And they're not the easiest thing to pick out of a shell. So if you're looking for an easy eating experience for your, your customer, out of the shell would be the way to go. And then, you know, you could put them over a risotto or pasta or pizza and they're just, they're ready to eat. So we have a lot of chefs that take them that way, but some prefer them in the shell. Well, and so I'm really excited to chat with some of the chefs who are using these snails because you just don't see escargot on menus other than drowning in butter and garlic. There's a classic preparation and then that seems like it. Yeah, we're hoping to kind of have a bit of a escargot renaissance and see if we can get some chefs to, to cook with these in kind of a different light very creatively and just see how versatile they are.
So Kate, my wife, she's super helpful with day-to-day -day operations. She's either sorting the snails or pulling out eggs, feeding them, moving them around, getting them ready for processing, and then she plays a big role in our processing day, and she's great at that. She's a much faster snail picker than I am, so I'm thankful that she's around. Kate has agreed to teach me how to pick one of these things, and She's promised not to laugh if I screw it up. I promise I won't. <laughs> so is this just a sewing needle? Yes. Cool. What's the technique? Uh, well, are you righty or lefty? Righty. OK, so you want the needle on your right hand. OK. And basically, all you do is you hold the shell like this. Mm -hmm. And then you take the needle and you poke it right here at the foot of the snail. And then you kind of twist the shell this way. So you follow the it. spiral. Right, you follow the spiral. All right, not bad at all. It's fun, actually. I'm sure after doing 7,000, so not so fun. <laughs> come, come talk to us in five hours. Exactly. All right, well, I'm gonna stand here and help with their 7,000 snails. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Cargo, and I just wanted to drop off a sample for the chef. I'll be there in just about five minutes. Thanks so much. Relationships with the chefs are key. That's kind of our platform that allows us to do what we do. And for them to know the whole story about how these snails came to be, it makes it special for them, and so it becomes a worthwhile, valuable product. We have his cargo from here, and it's beautiful. And, you know, there's a pride, there's a connection, there's a story that's very important, sometimes neglected by people, but the story behind what we eat. You want to try to have a print of the terroir, in a way. I mean, escargot feeds off the soil of the place. That's a print. That's a direct print, right? And you taste it. For me, like, it's more delicate, more refined. It's beautiful. So I'm making this escargot dish. We call it escargot and chorizo. Hugh made a delicious Spanish-style, kind of a Basque region uh, preparation. He did a cast iron saute of baked apples, some house-made chorizo, and kind of reduced cider and maple syrup with the whole in-shell snail. He had kind of stewed them or braised them in advance, and then he added them to this dish and kind of glazed them with butter and with the drippings from the chorizo, which is an incredible preparation. Fresh snails are an incredibly unique ingredient, and here at Industry Standard, Chef Greg is playing around with Asian flavors. Let's get in the kitchen and chat with him. Here in America, chefs never work with fresh snails. The tailors start growing them. I remember hearing about actually when I was dating this other girl that, that knew him, and she's like, yeah, this, this uh, idiot is opening a voice on snail farm. I'm like, snail farm, that's crazy. Taylor said, do you want to try this stuff? And I was like, sure, you know? And I tried it out, I was blown away. You taste it immediately, the herbaceous mushroom taste to it, and it's sweet. If you treat it like really nice shrimp or langoustine, that's how I try to approach it. Greg does an incredible job. He's very creative, and he's always kind of coming up with new preparations. Months before we were even really up and running, we gave him some of our early test batches, and he would come up with a couple dishes. It was crazy, because the first thing he comes up with is a ramen dish and then this incredible wonton with a fermented black bean vinaigrette. And that's totally not what we were thinking. You know, we were like, here's some snails. I'm sure he'll cook them in garlic and butter and call it a day. But no, he went above and beyond. So it was just an eye-opening experience. You know, that was a moment where we were like, holy cow, like, this could be anything. It could be, it could be whatever you want it to be. It could go into any restaurant, no matter what kind of food they're serving, and fit in well with any of that stuff.
Land on Long Island is expensive. It is so expensive, in fact, that it can be very difficult for farmers to get started and also to keep their farms. So the Peconic Land Trust has launched an incredibly innovative program called Farms for the Future, and we are going to meet their director next. All right, Dan and I are heading to the farm. Which farm are we gonna see first? Well, I think we're gonna go down to our agricultural center in Southold and we'll get started there. All right. We're down here at the agricultural center in Southold. The whole farm is 23 and a half acres. And what we do here is get new farmers started. Each farmer gets one acre for up to five years. Most of the new farmers don't have equipment and they don't have access to any of the infrastructure. So it's pretty much a turnkey. If they want to give it a try, we have what's necessary to get started. So this farm here, we're actually started a rent here to feisty acres. Feisty acres. Feisty acres. And they're the ones that are doing different types of game birds. At the trust here, we try to protect the whole history of farming and the whole business of farming. We buy farmland. We also get farmland donated to us, and we protect the farmland from development. The Peconic Land Trust has kind of a, a new farmer initiative where they look for these new kind of startup companies, and they bring those people on. They'll give them a small parcel of land for a highly discounted rate, but they kind of incubate that farming operation for a number of years until they're ready to kind of be put out on their own. We were lucky enough to be accepted by their board after a lot of convincing because they were all kind of new to the snail farming movement. Taylor, I thought he had a very good idea. Um, he's certainly a part of the program. This was a little different because he didn't need actually farm land. He just needed a spot for his greenhouse. Have you ever heard of snail caviar? No? Well, you are not the only one. It is a relatively unknown delicacy here in the U.S. The eggs are tiny and they're white. And here is another really interesting snail fact. They are all hermaphrodites, which means they all can lay eggs. So we're actually gonna go inside right now and taste some of that caviar with Taylor. Right here in the container is a pile of the little tiny white eggs. Fresh snail caviar. So this is uncured snail caviar. When we start producing this on a larger format, we'll gather this and cure it in a salt solution uh, for about a day or so, and then it'll get packed into caviar tins and, and shipped out to restaurants all over the country. So, wow. But now we're gonna taste this fresh. So this is a little pile that we dug out of the soil. The snails will bury themselves in the dirt, kind of like a little turtle, and they'll deposit this clutch of eggs uh, into the soil, and then they'll come back up, cover the nest up with dirt, and then kind of move away. And then two weeks later, the uh, little baby snails will hatch and, and come out of the nest. But uh, yeah, we're gonna give these a little taste, so you'll get to see what, what fresh snail uh, caviar tastes like. Awesome. It's really mild, and it is a little bit mushroomy, a little bit carroty where, you know, caviar, caviar, fish roe, has a very strong, briny, sea, bracing flavor. You're right, this is just really, really gentle. Yeah. You're really innovating new products for people to use in restaurant settings. There are some producers of snail caviar in, in Europe, but um, they're not willing to give away their secrets. So we're, <laughs> we're kind of, you know, breaking our own ground here in the U.S. with this and, and figuring it out as we go. And uh, yeah, we're, we're happy to offer a new innovative product to the chefs and they're excited to try it out, yeah. How old is this little snail? So he's maybe two or three weeks old. This is a full grown adult, so well over, you know, eight months old. When the snails are mature, they'll be ready to mate. So at that point, they'll find somebody else that's interested. Uh, they're hermaphrodites, so it could really be anyone. And then they'll be about a month after mating uh, before they're ready to lay eggs. So another interesting thing about these is they have a mechanism called a love dart. Okay. Uh, which is actually a calcified spear that they form and they will shoot into whoever they've chosen to be their mating partner, which is meant to sort of signal that it's time to go. There'll be a little spear sticking out of the snail's body. Well, 
Okay. I'm speechless because that is so cool. Yeah, it's pretty neat. <laughs> this is where the Here snails are. Live. This is where the snails are hanging out. That's right. We've got somewhere between 40 and 50,000 snails right now. Uh, and they're all sleeping, so it's very quiet. Uh, they're nocturnal. <laughs> Is it noisy when it's they're noisy awake? It's noisy when they're awake. It's like a <laughs> snail party in here at night. They're nocturnal animals, so they sleep during the day, they party at night. So they're hermaphrodites, they have thousands of teeth, they have buggy little eyes. The eyes are on the tops of some long antennas to help them kind of see and, and sense the world around them. They have some smaller, like, sensory antennas really kind of coming out near their mouth that helps them kind of understand what's going on. Their eyesight's not so great, and they can't hear. They don't have ears. But uh, they do a pretty good job of figuring out what's going on around them. So the species that we raise is the petit gris, or the little gray snail. Cornu aspersum is the Latin name. This species came from Europe to the United States in the 1850s as a food source, and they kind of went nuts. They went wild um, because they reproduced very quickly, and they became a pest. Uh, they eat up a lot of agriculture, homeowners, gardens. They'll kind of wreak havoc in there. At one point, uh, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, the US government dubbed it an invasive species and made it very difficult for people to raise and grow them. So we had to do a lot of work with them to be able to bring them into the state of New York because they're not native here, and that took a lot of uh, collaboration with the government to be on the same page with how we were going to contain them. We hatched this idea of putting them inside a greenhouse where they'd be able to get lots of sunlight, fresh air, have this kind of like outdoor environment without actually being outdoors. And the other thing is that we didn't have a whole lot of money, so we went with a pretty small greenhouse. It's about 300 square feet. But to be able to have more production, we went with a stacking kind of shelving system. So instead of having the snails all laid out on the ground, we decided to put them in contained pens. We're able to have you know, upwards of 100,000 snails in that greenhouse if we need to, all in a very small sort of footprint space. So you still are a chef because he actually runs these pop-up dinners called Paw Paw. How often do you do those? Uh, most Saturday nights. So an actual, you know, working chef, what made you decide that you wanted to become a farmer first off and a snail farmer of all things second? Yeah, well, I suppose fascination and curiosity uh, drove a lot of it and just the challenge of doing this after you know, cooking in some pretty high-end, stressful restaurants for 12 years, a change of pace is, is kind of a good thing. This is definitely not stressful. No, this is very calming. <laughs> I come out here, I listen to the birds chirping and the wind breezing, and we just get to hang out with the snails. These snails, I love that they're kind of weird. You know, that's cool, because weird stuff is fun and exciting. I'm learning new things about them all the time and then the connection food-wise to how they can be prepared and how delicious they are, that's exciting for me on, you know, kind of a chef level too. And then just seeing the joy and content in chefs and home cooks' faces when we get to give them these things is super enriching for us. It's just the whole process of being able to offer something that people either haven't had yet or haven't had in a long time is really exciting. Yeah. So to wrap up this episode, we are here in the farmhouse kitchen at the Peconic Land Trust. And I wanted to make sure that you at home had some ideas on how you could actually cook with snails yourself. So Taylor is gonna show us one of the recipes that he's developed that is pretty simple. Very simple, super, super easy to make at home. Uh, common ingredients, but super delicious. It's an Italian dish, uh, kind of a traditional Italian uh, snail preparation called babalucci, and the babalucci is the Sicilian word for snail. So first thing is some garlic. Don't cry. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> cry, I'm probably gonna cry. So these shallots, we're just gonna slice thinly like this. So we're gonna <laughs> chop just a little bit of this parsley, and then just a little bit of basil. And now we just cook, we put it together. All right. Simple as that.
It's kind of a very hearty, stick to your ribs snail stew. So, and it's definitely uh, best enjoyed with some crusty bread. This winery is right next door. Yeah, this is McCall Vineyard. So their vines kind of butt right up against our snail greenhouse. So. It's like the epitome of what grows together goes together, I this guess. This is it. This is it. All right, should we dig yeah, into the snails? Yeah, let's give it a shot. Mm. Oh, it's so perfect with those really savory flavors and the earthiness of the snail. That's delicious stuff. I'll see you next time. There's more information on the makers featured in this series, along with recipes and extra videos at wearetastemakers.com. Tastemakers was funded in part by... What does a craftsperson look like? Is it this? Or this? Or is it this? Is it possible a craftsperson might also look like this? Edward Jones salutes the makers who share their expertise and take pride in their craft. And by Fleischmann's Yeast and A.B. Murray.